<laughs> it's all good. Right. So, um, wow. thank you very much. I'm, I'm a lot shorter for the opportunity to uh, speak here today, I guess, and just share. Whoops, some of my. Uh, some of my thoughts. We'll get back to that in a second. I, I just want to lower your expectations a little bit because this is like a totally new topic for me in thinking about learning health systems. It's just not where my head has been, at least explicitly. And so bear with me. Um, I hope what I say is, is relevant in some ways. Um, and also, I just want to clarify, I'm actually you know, part-time at the University of Washington, or UW, as we refer to it. And, and in that capacity, um, I spend the rest of my time working directly with community-based organizations uh, in doing um, community-based research as well as research that's focused on ethics and translation. And, and that that is going to probably come through in this discussion. So sometimes when I'm talking about sort of constituents, I'm, I'm thinking about um, not necessarily patients as patients defined, but in the context of sort of just living as people who, who live in different worlds. So. Um, and for some reason, when I you know, was asked to come here and I started thinking about learning health systems, it just reminded me of Isaac Asimov's foundation. And here's a little description of it that I kind of thought was interesting. Um, for 12,000 years, the galactic empire has ruled supreme, and now it is dying. But only Harry Selden, creator of the revolutionary science of psychohistory, can see into the future to a dark age of ignorance, barbarism, and warfare that will last 30,000 years. To preserve knowledge and save mankind, Selden gathers the best minds in the empire, both scientists and scholars, and brings them to a bleak planet at the edge of the galaxy to serve as a beacon of hope for future generations. And he calls this his sanctuary the foundation. And so the foundation could represent sort of a dark uber LHS, right, learning health system. And, <laughs> and like the foundation, LHSs you know, might face sort of this constant challenge that despite sort of the immense predictive power, what you could really do with the science, there are these anomalies, these incomplete data sets, these, these incomplete sets of knowledge, these gaps, and that, that subvert prediction on this galactic scale, right? And okay, so that's one dark reading of it, but on reflection, I think the comparison also prevents a more fundamental question about, or for learning health systems, that what knowledge should inform healthcare and or what health-related decision-making to improve human health, right? So what, what are we actually talking about? And, and, and I'm ignorant enough to ask those types of broad questions here. And so as we think about health equity in particular and what that might demand of, of learning health system, I ask you to keep that scope of knowledge, that epistemic question sort of at the front of your minds. So I, this might be too obvious, but I entitled my talk Minding and Mining, sort of at the same time, the gap, to reflect both the promise, obviously, of, of mining the data to learn about and ultimately reduce health disparities, as well as to recognize that throughout the process, uh, there's going to be a number of issues that we need to be mindful of. And in an analysis of this dissolving line between research and, and, and uh, healthcare in, in the context of genomic translation, uh, some of my colleagues and, and mentors, really, Susan Wolf, uh, Wiley Burke, and Barbara Koenig, uh, situated us uh, in the ethics of um, a sort of T4 phase translational cycle, is what they call it, right, in the sort of cycle that they've come up with. And, and to quote, they state, the T4 stage corresponding to the outcomes phase finally addresses patient and population health impact. The ethics of outcomes assessment becomes relevant. A core issue is whether the intervention alleviates or exacerbates health disparities. And this makes central the ethics of evaluating and addressing health disparities, including justice, stakeholder engagement, the inclusive governance of healthcare research, delivery, and evaluation. And I think that sort of sets the stage a little bit for what we've been talking about and what you also talked about last year. So today I'm just going to go over some points. I think uh, Jody actually did a great job for me, so I won't have to go into detail about the 2016 symposium and what struck out as important to me. Uh, then I'm going to sort of highlight my normative two cents, I guess, about group benefits and harms, which is something I don't think anyone else is maybe explicitly thinking about. Uh, and then end with what research questions we should be asking in the, uh, in the space of learning health systems to promote health equity. And that's not that I have answers, but that I think it's a, post, a question to pose to all of us here. So starting here, Vince, oh, my picture is not there. Maybe it's an earlier set. Okay. So Vince Bonham actually, um, that'll be interesting. Vince Bonham, uh, sorry, different set of slides, um, argued uh, really for genomic inclusion 
which I think is an interesting point, right? That we need to, in order to address the equity, the differences in benefit that accrue from genomic information, we need to be inclusive. And that's sort of we see as an input point, right? How do we sort of address the input of the data sets that we have in order to encourage um, equity in the end? But I think it's equally important for us, and in this space appropriate, to think about the outcomes and how do we ensure that follow-up from genomic information, that the appropriate care is being able to be provided in a way um, that places benefit in front of the patient rather than the potential harms. And so in that sense, you know, I encourage us to think about in all learning health systems, to think about sort of early adopter settings of usually genomic medicine, usually medical genetics, versus sort of those later adopter settings within a large system where you might have FQHCs or, or sort of that setting in which there's a lot more um, underserved populations being served in that setting. And that think about those differences and what the benefits are going to be and, and whether they can be accrued or not as sort of a lens to sort of take on this topic. This is actually um, a slide from Yvonne Lewis and Kent Key. And again, Jody set it up. They talked about this continuum of engagement and research, which is, I think, very um, appropriate and very sort of grounding for everyone. But I think another key point on community and stakeholder engagement is to determine what constitutes actually, you know, good engagement things that we value in different phases of research. So going back to that uh, translational cycle, at those different phases, what are we talking about when we talk about engagement? It's not just at the front to get them in the door, to get them enrolled, to get them in the, the sample and to be done with that. But it's how in each of those stages are you engaging our participants and, and as, as communities of people coming to us. Um, and no, that one's not there. Okay. So this is a slide from Rich Sharp. And I should go to here real quick. So this is a slide from Rich Sharp's talk, which, you know, he really emphasized, again, community engagement, that you can do it, that you can work with advisory committees, but it takes money to do that, and you need the resources for it. That's all good and, and makes sense to me. But what's also interesting is that he really focused on sort of this, and we heard it earlier today from one of the speakers, the good for society versus protecting individuals from harm. And I think that that is... Yeah, that's very appropriate, but it's also sort of interesting to me that that's always sort of the dichotomy that we place in front of ourselves. And so uh, let's just keep holding that for just a moment, too, and I'll, I'll share again, thinking about Patricia Kingori's work that she sure shared sort of this, this point that systems and structures have politics and ethics and an imagination about their users with positive and negative effects. Now, I'm trying to string together two ideas here, but like, and I do this too, right? We all do that. We sort of make our assumptions and sort of see and start to construct people and groups and populations the way that we need to see them for our purposes. And, and so what I'm suggesting here is that we could actually think about this tension a little bit more in a more complicated way, that we start to place sort of both on Rich's scale and on Patricia's insight, that we can consider groups not just as aggregates of individuals or as populations to be studied, but as those with collective interests who have common and often local experiences of social determinants that might impact the outcomes in our healthcare system. So thinking about sort of group benefits and harms um, and introducing that topic, it, it derives from my Career Development Award, um, and we have a work group that's been working on this topic called the Group Benefits and Harms Work Group. Um, and you might be wondering, so what is he really talking about, right? So what are group benefits and harms? What's a group? How do you, what are you talking about? So uh, we define groups as sort of being distinct from populations in that a group can be self-identified or ascribed, such as Korean Americans, or um, they could be organized around a condition, like a disease condition like autism. Uh, a group could involve some form of shared social experience. So we're pretty expansive in how we think about groups, such as living in poverty, right? Could be thought of as a group, especially in a local environment, right, a regional environment. Groups can include those that are sort of legally recognized. So we think about sovereign nations and Native American communities here in our, in our country. Um, and then we also um, sort of recognize that groups are often emergent and dynamic, right? So it's not like we don't want to just stabilize sort of what we think of as a group, whether it's, it's sort of culturally stereotyped in some way, but thinking about them as shifting and changing that we need to reassess and think about that over time. So in that sort of setting, uh, um, you know, we can think of classic group harms as being sort of a, a violation of, of someone's um, reputation or identity as a group, such that, you know, a hate crime doesn't just affect the person who experienced the crime, but it affects everyone who identifies with that, um, that group. And, and another type of um, sort of group benefit that we can think about uh, that we've been kicking around at the University of Washington is um, APOL1 genetic testing and, and, and its association with, uh, well, the potential to reduce disparities in end-stage and chronic kidney disease, especially among African Americans because it's a condition that's disproportionately um, suffered. 
And so, you know, there, there are ways to think about this. Oops, sorry. And so thinking about our preliminary framework here a little bit, again, we distinguish groups from populations. And then in genomics, we've sort of tended to sort of focus on addressing group harms, but we haven't really thought about group benefits. So we really wanted to lay that out on the table as a possibility for us to think about, right? Again, risk versus benefit in our assessments. Um, we also wanted to consider justice not only as distributive, not only about handing out those chits, um, but also involving recognition of groups uh, and valuing their full participation in society, coming from a tradition of sort of thinking about, um, thinking about uh, justice in a more complex way, I think. And then we consider, um, sort of we emphasize the importance of considering how social position frames what is seen as a benefit or harm, right? We all sort of think about what benefits and harms, but we, we can't see them sort of beyond our own can in some ways. So we need to be able to sort of think through that. Um, and and uh, I'll just go through this really quickly. It was uh, from an earlier talk that I gave in the past about all of us uh, and sort of thinking about justice and equity. And I think it's a good case example for us to think about how to apply this thinking. So taking just a moment, um, given sort of all the potential for all of us to enable precision medicine and that failing to include underserved populations threatens that greater disparities in healthcare, um, starting really in genetic medicine, I think we get that point that's articulated by Vince Bonham, right, that we need to be inclusive. But yet we try to, we tend to focus a lot of our attention on return of results um, and, and when that's really sort of additional or, or secondary to the broader transformative potential of the initiative, which is the knowledge gained, right. Um, yet the potential, um, for receiving results, at least to some portion of participants, is significant, right? Some people might really be helped in the setting, but they're really limited to those who are able to follow up and benefit from that type of care. And as such, we're explicitly concerned that benefits and risks will differ between the average participant who comes in through a, a health provider organization versus those through historically underrepresented, underserved sort of mechanisms. So. In addition, sort of the, the potential for group harms and benefits is felt more acutely among some uh, underrepresented groups. Um, and rightly, the PMI actually, from the very get-go, has argued for inclusion and partnership and benefit and preventing group harms. All criticisms withstanding, I think that was very foundational in, in its formation. And given these dimensions of all of us and an underlying value to minimize harms to social groups, the underserved, and to PMI itself, decisions about return of results, we think, should be evaluated from the perspective of the most vulnerable. And in this case, those historically underserved and underrepresented in genetic and biomedical research. And I'm not arguing that this ought to be the only criteria. That doesn't really make sense. But it's a key criteria that we ought to be thinking about when we evaluate sort of the action steps, the steps that are being taken in the All of Us initiative. And that that would impact sort of our return of results policies, our practices, et cetera. Uh, and I know that John has already heard this in the past and we've talked a bit about it. And, and I see that and feel that coming from All of Us very clearly. So this, the, what questions should we be asking in the space of, of learning health systems and, and, and health equity? And, and many of you have probably seen, you know, we've all gone to the trainings. This is sort of thinking about equity. There's the idea of equality that, you know, just giving everyone the same thing just doesn't get us to equal levels of much um, in, in terms of outcomes. We think about equity as being sort of this focal point of like, well, if we sort of tailor and differentiate what people's needs are, that might get us all to some sort of state. There's the more radical view of like, well, let's just tear down the damn wall, right? <laughs> let's just get get rid of the barriers that result in differences in health outcomes, et cetera. And so then, you know, you start to think about like, well, if we're thinking about equity in this way, um, you know, maybe we have an opportunity in learning health systems to think about what are the outcomes of equity strategies and policies in this context, right? Whether that's organizational policy and governance changes, or whether that's actually the work being done out in the community that's, that's related to or being done in conjunction with learning health systems. Do improvements in social determinants produce healthcare outcomes? I really wonder about that a lot. And, and, and I wonder if that's something I bet people are studying. I don't, but I hope that that's a key component of when we think about learning health systems. Um, and do equity strategies and policy interact with improvements in social determinants? That's going to require different sets of data to be combined and, and worked on together, but um, I think there's some possibilities there. I just ignore this. That was not supposed to be there anymore. Um, sorry. Thinking about sort of um, what the gurus in health disparities research have been telling us, I think that we can sort of have an, uh, make, make our efforts to, to train our eyes on interventions that address race and racism and structural inequalities a bit more, at least ask that question in the learning health system context and, and what are the opportunities to contribute there. 
Um, I think looking at informatics strategies and health IT in particular gets really interesting. Um, I, I really like the, the concept here on the third sort of row section about community health informatics. So I do a lot of work with community-based organizations doing needs assessments in their, in their local very small marginal communities in some ways. And that how can we tie that data back into consumer health data to uh, population level data with the public health departments and with the learning health systems, the Department of Pediatrics, the Ch Seattle Children's Hospital that I work for and work in. How does that all fit together and how can we actually expand our cycle of learning? Right? Um, this is a, about health IT. This was a report put out by NORC uh, oh, seven years ago, I guess. And again, uh, this was a place that I found some interesting questions that they were <coughs> asking about sort of what are, you know, some key questions like what health IT tools have potential for greatest uh, impact in communities with health disparities, uh, unintended adverse consequences of health IT, what are the barriers for vulnerable populations, um, how can systems be designed to address these barriers. Those are the types of questions that they were asking. And what's interesting to me is that those are, I assume, questions that can be asked in a setting in which we're really moving toward more digital and, and um, health IT sort of informed um, healthcare. So. I had a few other thoughts, and I guess I'll just leave with them very briefly. This, uh, this topic for me is a much larger project about individualistic versus collectivistic ethics, and how do we sort of harmonize or deal with those things. And I study them in the context of immigrant and refugee communities, and I, so I encourage you to sort of, again, look from the 20,000 feet or 30,000 feet perspective and see where are those tensions in our settings of learning health systems. Um, the use of race in research and medical practice, I think of as both a threat and a target. It's a threat when it results in cultural and biologically reductionistic conclusions, but it's also an opportunity because we can sort of actually work with people who identify in these ways in real world ways that have impacts on their lives. Um, and then I think there's a lot of um, work being done on identifying new digital divides that, that are also e-health divides uh, and that they're evolving norms about what we consider to be sensitive information and what privacy means that we should really be investigating uh, in that space a bit more. And maybe again, LHSs provide that as an opportunity. And finally on trust, because it's that pervasive theme that we've seen. You know, I wrote on my little widget on the table, gear, gear. thank you, sorry, gear, I'll be official. Um, I put trust in the middle and I put an arrow to challenges and opportunities or threats, or no, ch challenges and strengths. Because I think on the one hand, yes, trust is key. It, it opens doors, it gets people in the door for research. It's also you know, a very important piece to the provider and patient interaction. But it also sometimes, at least my experience has been on, both, on all sides of the fence, trust sometimes also alleviates personal responsibility to the extent that um, they just give me all the trust, right? And I kind of feel like I can do anything I want to do in my research, or I feel like, you know, we've heard this in our bioethics sort of seminars that we're, we're sort of facing this problem that in a patient-centered sort of um, shared decision-making context, too much trust can also be an issue. Right, because you're not able to engage in a way that, that helps to support meaningful value-based decision-making. Uh, so just as a little caveat to think about that. And then finally, that there's another way to think about trust as trust in people and institutions, but also as trustworthy practices. And that maybe we can also focus on the actions a little bit more that might help us to identify uh, sort of what's on the line in decision-making. So I'll end there, and thank you.